Thanks, folks. Uh, so, as my lovely picture up there says, my name is Paul McFarlane. I am the Head of Managed Service Operations at a company called Quorum, Quorum Network Resources. I've been there for three years now, and I've spent 20 years working in IT service um, through many, many, many service desks, uh, change management, problem management, and latterly major incident management. And what I wanted to talk to you guys today about is not so much the technology side of things, because there's lots of very, very clever people here talking about um, products and integrations and things like that, but it's more around how those integrations and AI and automation will actually work within a service desk. We've started our transition, if you like, into that world. Um, we've found a number of different things that are good, a number of different things that are bad. Uh, and I kind of just wanted to share sort of a bit of a case study approach to what we're doing and see if it resonates with anybody here today. I haven't spoken in front of a room of people for 10 years, so I have to remember to breathe. So please remind me if you don't, don't mind. So the first part is talking about automation and about AI, and are you ready to do that? So this, we can have a number of conversations around what the latest technology is, what the integrations are going to look like, but how do you actually get to the point of making use of them? So the first thing it's going to do is really change your mindset around the data that you have, the, the documentation that you have, how you're using that data, how you're storing that data, and then only then are you able to actually retrieve that data and use it effectively through automation or predominantly through AI. Automation has been around for a while now. There's a lot of different things that are being done through an automated fashion. We've got tickets and things going through our IT service desk. Um, and to be aware, we use a third party tool for our IT service um, product. It's called ConnectWise. So again, I'm kind of talking around how they're selling their future and what, how that, what that means for me in the long term. But again, we've got to make sure that all our data is correct. So, our configuration items, our knowledge articles, all these kind of things have to be standardized, they have to be written, they have to be version controlled. We have to make sure they're all up to date because, as it says at the back, uh, there's a different phrase you can use for this, but bad data in, bad data out. How do you make sure that if you've got the most efficient AI system in the world, that's great, but it's bringing back data that's two, three years out of date, or you've changed your configuration items, or you've done an update and you've not updated something correctly, so therefore it's bringing back the wrong service, all this kind of information. You have to get yourselves ready for that. So how do you do that from a client point of view as well? So it's not just about ourselves and the service desk. We've got a lot of clients out there who are jumping on the bandwagon and want to get um, into AI, into co-pilot and things like that. But the big thing that we have to talk to them around is about data governance and about the understanding that any data you put into an engine like this, into an AI engine, is potentially not your data anymore. So you have to understand that you can't, as much as you want to get up there and have that badge of honor saying you have an AI system in place, if the data isn't secure, then you're kind of opening up a whole world of pain, especially for our clients. Some of them are legal clients, some of them are financial clients. So putting that data through an AI engine and having that in the public domain is a, is a concern. So we want to have a look at that. You also need to have a look at what it is you're trying to fix. So that's, again, what we've been looking at at the moment. Will it actually improve anything? What is it that we're trying to deliver? Are we doing it for the sake of doing it? Because it's, it's cool, it's trendy, so that's what we want to do. Or are we actually going to have a tangible output and a tangible fix of what we're delivering? So these are the kind of questions that we've been asking ourselves. What is it that it's actually going to bring us? And that's kind of where we're going with this conversation today. Uh, there are lots and lots of different integration systems out there that can connect to, to our systems, to ConnectWise. You've got ServiceNow, you've got Halo IT that are also upstairs. You've got lots and lots of different systems, PIA. Anything that can put a, a, a chatbot or a, any kind of AI search function onto the system you already use. But again, is it going to work for you? Is it actually going to save time? Is it it's something that you actually really need? Because there will be a cost involved to that. <coughs> So what we know about AI and automation, what it's going to do, so from, from our standpoint, password resets, you're never going to escape a password reset. You're never going to escape a printer in all these years. You're never going to have to escape a printer. Back in my original days, it was modems, but that shows you how old I am. It's uh, all these printers, um, joiners, movers, levers, things like that. That's all the things that can be automated. So all day long, you can automate that in and out. We're using that at the moment, using um, a form-based process where our clients will fill out a, a document, they will have all the a checkbox of their requirements, they fill that out, they send that through, and that triggers automation in the background, and that basically orders the kit that they need through our third-party supplier for kit. 
It goes through their automation processes for approval. So if they're asking for a drive to access that they may need approval for, it automatically sends that approval out to the right business area. That then comes back in and the process moves forward. There's no human interaction in that other than the approval processes and at the end of that we've got a fully functioning member of staff with their kit in their hand and we can do their induction. And again, there's a possibility in the future for us to create an induction process that doesn't require us to be there too. But, as we'll come to, that's probably not where we want to go because that removes your ability to build a relationship with your client. Um, so from our service desk at the moment, we have a number of, of tickets of that nature. Um, we do a lot of other stuff as well, but we do have a lot of join us, move us, leavers. We do have a lot of share drive access requests for our clients. Uh, Passage resets are always uh, a given. Print installations, things like that. If we automate that, what will that do for us? So if we put automation in place for that, that's going to give us time. But what are we going to do with that time? How are we going to use that time effectively? Um, it says they're automated ticket routing. So again, imagine a world where all your tickets are passed on automatically. Now, if you're a bigger service desk, that's going to be really, really important. So if you're a significant size service desk, you've got first line, second line, third line. In some cases, you've got operations team, networking team, application teams. Automated ticket routing is, is a no-brainer. That's going to absolutely, absolutely help you and get the tickets to the right place at the right time. So that's an instant cost saving. That makes sense. If, like us, you don't have that, it's still going to be able to be a benefit to you because you can use that to alert the right people in the right place. So we still have major incident management. We still have service delivery managers who need to know if our ticket is not being handled correctly or if their client still needs engagement and involvement. So we're going to be able to use that automated alert to, to triage that ticket and to send it to the right place. What we've also done is we've been able to build integrations to other third-party ticket systems as well. And we've actually done that in-house ourselves, but we've connected ConnectWise, connected ConnectWise to Jira. So we've been able to, we've got a, a client that we have that uses Jira in their app team. That's their preferred method of choice. They want the tickets to go into there, and then they want those ticket updates to then come back into the ticketing system that the, the, the client uses so that it's auditable because they're regulatory managed. So we built that integration. So we've got a service ITSM tool to another ITSM tool through automation delivering a service, which is great. You're then going to have chatbots and virtual assistants, which at the end of the day, uh, always have a smile, always are cheery, uh, never really have a, a bad day. Um, and it says here the unsung heroes of the service desk. I'm not so sure about that. But it's, um, it's that ability to create a self-service function that gives your clients a sense of ownership back. At the moment, there's a lot of clients that feel that they're giving away a little bit too much of themselves to their IT service, and they feel a little bit powerless from that. So being able to give them a chat box functionality that they can use to self-service their own password resets or requests, that's a no-brainer. That's going to be a really big win. And then for us on the service desk, having that chat box feature that's integrated into our ITSM tool, that prompts us to do things very, very quickly. So again, do you want to reset this password? Yes, I do. Do you want to uh, um, provide permission for this? Yes, I do. And it will automatically go and do all of that. That's brilliant. That's what we're looking for, because that gives us time. And for managed service providers especially, time is essential for us, because we are the, the doers. My team do everything from managing the service, first line, second line, third line. They are project um, delivery specialists as well. They do everything. So if I can give them time back to train, and to be better analysts and to be better people, then that's a no-brainer for me. And that's where AI and automation is going to be a big win for us as a company. Moving forward, so just talking a little bit about that. So giving us the time to do these things will allow us to upskill our staff. So working hand in hand with AI and automation, we're actually going to be able to give more back to our staff. We're not replacing them. We're not getting rid of them. We're not limiting their abilities to grow, which is actually the opposite. We're going to use it to allow us to grow. We're very much a company that invests in people. We want to work with cool people. We want to work with our friends. We want to be able to build relationships with our clients. This is what's going to give us that time back. Because as technology has changed and moved forward, we found that a lot of time is spent managing that technology, that infrastructure, managing Azure environments and all these kind of things, all the networking operations, moving, doing the transitions from on-prem to to the cloud, all that kind of stuff takes up a lot of time. And for a, again, for a managed service provider, 
we want to be able to build the relationships with our clients and we want to do that and continue to do that. So this is where it's going to come into play for us. Automation through all the low-level tasks means that we can actually spend a little bit more time in the gnarly tickets. We can fix things up, service improvements. We can have a little bit more conversations with our clients around sort of business improvements that they might see some benefits of using automation and AI with, and be able to grow those relationships because we're not, spent, we're not spending time talking, um, fixing repetitive tickets all the time. We're fixing things better. We also want to move away from, we're not an SLA-based service desk. Uh, we're more of an XLA service desk. So I don't know if anyone know what XLA means. Any difference to an SLA? Experience, yeah. So that's what we're kind of moving towards. We're a wee bit of a hybrid, more experience-based than we are SLA-based. For myself and my, my team, we look at SLAs as a guide to how we're doing, not as a measure for our staff and our growth. We, we use the SLA measurements to just have a conversation around potential um, issues or, or pressure points that we might have. We don't use it as a, as a stick to beat people with and have that conversation. We're a little bit more about the experience of that. So yeah, we delivered our transformation for you. We, we moved you to Intune, Office 365. We moved you to the cloud. How was that for you? Did that deliver what you were looking for? And I think that as the year goes on, and especially with AI and things like that coming into play, if you've got one element delivering an automated AI solution, but your service doesn't match that, then you're going to be found out pretty quickly. So having one element deliver a service very, very quickly and efficiently and on time every single time, but then the rest of your service doesn't match that, then you're going to have a problem. So it's going to force you to bring up that experience SLA and force you to start looking at that in a different way. And then what we've got there, which is really key for me, is spotting trends within your own staff. So there is a Teams integration that ConnectWise offer. And we live out of teams, so everybody spends their life in teams, talking to people, sometimes about work, other times about random nonsense, really, to be honest. But we spend a lot of time in teams, so having a teams integration that I can walk in in the morning and go, right, tell me about my day, what am I doing today, because I need that. Um, tell me how to write a speech for a room full of people about AI and automation. I can get to do that for me as well. But I can get it to give me a pressure point on my, my tickets. I can get it to do sentiment analysis, which is the, probably, for me, the real key part of, of AI, is being able to do an assessment of a ticket and a, an integration or an interaction within the ticket between you, uh, an analyst and a client. Um, it also does emails as well, which mine, I won't tell you what it says about my emails, but apparently I need a bit of work on that as well. It's, uh, it will be able to do sentiment analysis. So if you, as a service manager, or if you're a leader, you're able to do sentiment analysis of tickets, and it's going to be able to tell you that, OK, I've got one-to-one -one coming up with Bob. I can get, bring me the Bob's tickets for the last month and, tell, and grade them on sentiment. So grade them on client happy to client unhappy. And that will be able to give me a conversation point with Bob around what he's been doing with these tickets. So it's no longer around how many tickets you fixed, how quickly you did it, all that kind of stuff. That's not really helping me help Bob to grow in any way, shape, or form. But it's more about the client experience. So of those tickets, say you fixed 100 tickets, well done, Bob. You fixed 100 tickets, 80 of them were brilliant. The client was really, you could tell from a sentiment analysis, from an AI sentiment analysis, that the interaction was great, the client was really happy, lots of good conversation points and stuff. You, can, you know that your, your service is in safe hands. If, and again, it's not foolproof, but if again it comes back and says, well, hang on a minute, Bob's not, he's a bit blunt not using pleases and thank yous, kind regards, all that kind of stuff. Is he really selling our product really well? Well, no, we need to have a bit of a conversation around that. He might be making all the, the boxes for an SLA-driven environment, but from an experience point of view, he's not hitting the mark. So we need to have that conversation. And again, it can pull that data out instantly. You're no longer having to wait for re reporting. It's probably the bane of our lives. I'm looking at my colleague here. The bane of our lives is reporting. But having something that's real time, being able to ask a question at any point, any time, so can you deliver me, I don't know, the last 20 tickets done by X person and order them by this, and it delivers that information to you. That's a winner. That's, a, that's a time saved all day long. That's what we're looking to do. And again, for me as a line manager, that's what I want to be doing for my staff. I want to be able to get a feel for the tickets that they're doing and get a feel for how they're interacting with clients. Obviously, you can do. Um, smile back and things like that. You can get performance reviews and, and, and people to grade the service from a ticket interaction point of view. But 
that is at the end of the process. This is actually measures the conversation all the way through and gives you a report on that. So I think that is a benefit from a line manager point of view. So a little bit more about automated workflow. So again, we've already got uh, password resets in play at the moment. We've got ticket routing in play at the moment. Um, we've got a lot of automated fixes in play at the moment as well. So we have an alert management system that comes in and it delivers loads of alerts on a daily basis. Um, we've been able to tune those out using some of automation. We've been able to script these a lot quicker. The integration that our, our partner, our ITSM provider, has created where you can use um, AI to help you write PowerShell scripts, things like that. So again, from a learning point of view, from our staff who may have a basic understanding of PowerShell, they're able to use the, the AI integration to put a PowerShell script in play and it will come back and tell you if it's absolute nonsense or if it's actually good or it needs a bit of this. You understand you're growing and you're learning from that. Um, if it's something really, really gnarly and you just need a bit of advice from that, again, you can put some kind of information in there and it will give you a response back, it will give you a script back. So again, these kind of things are a really big win for us. Human touch, again, we've probably talked on that already, but it's basically about making sure that we, we build relationships with clients. There are so many, if I take licensing for an example, so we provide licensing, Microsoft licensing to our clients. There are a huge amount of companies out there at the moment that are selling licenses on, on bulk, en masse, selling it for probably more than half the price that we are selling it for and other providers are selling it for because they're buying it in bulk and they're just chucking it out there, whatever price that may be. So the, the client relationship management part of that is going to have to be even bigger and even better. We're going to have to work harder to get out there and get our clients on board and get new clients on board and get them to, to buy into our, our way forward. So, this, again, gives us the time to do that. We're not doing the basic level stuff anymore. We're actually going out to do that. And we're using the information that it brings back as well to get real-time updates on how our clients are doing. Um, and then, again, using sort of the, the AI integrations and the, the automation integrations, we've got service delivery managers on our team. They can use the sentiment analysis to, again, get a grade. So I've got a service review in a week's time. Give me all the tickets for my client based on sentiment, bad to good. So you get a grade of what the tickets that you need to address straight away with your client. You can have an automated ticket that goes, by the way, this ticket is being dealt with by Paul. Paul's not being very nice to our client. I think you should go and have a look at that. And it could do that kind of thing. It could give you that prompt for action. And again, you're, being, you're no longer being reactive at the end of a service meeting where they say, oh, by the way, here's a month's worth of problems I've had. Fix them. And it's too late to do anything about that. You've actually got an alert that says, you've got a problem with this ticket. Go and look at it. And whether it just needs a gentle hand or a gentle conversation, you're actually being a little bit more proactive in what you're doing in that space. Um, we be, we're a Microsoft-aligned company, so we're a gold partner with Microsoft. So we use Copilot, and we're going to be using Copilot quite heavily. Um, these are just a couple of things that we've been using Copilot for in our in our company. So we've been able to, again, sentiment analysis and email analysis and things like that as well. So a lot of our guys are now rewording a lot of the, the way that they write emails and it gives you a little bit of advice. Whether you choose to listen to that advice or not is entirely up to yourself, but it gives you that ability to, to assess tone. Again, from my point of view, there are a lot of people who work in IT service, uh, work on IT service desks, who may be the most clever people you've ever met in your entire life but they might not be the best people person. So what this is going to allow you to do is to help those people interact with your clients better, to create a, create a standard response to your clients across the piece. And you're helping them learn how to interact with clients and very slowly do that. And that's, again, where AI could benefit that. And that's what we're seeing at the moment is with the co-pilot review of an email and the tone of an email, because you can never assess tone in an email anyway. Some people think <clears throat> a perfectly viable comment is not a very nice comment. But again, it's just helping them sign things off properly and helping them engage really well. Responding to customer reports and queries, that's a no-brainer. We've got that assessing how we're replying, we're replying to our clients. We've got an overview of what we're doing with our service uh, engagements. We've got it reviewing some of our service reporting as well to tell us whether it's good or bad, whether the tone of things like this is correct as well. So if we're going out to do client engagements, What's the tone like? What's its view on that? And again, it's a machine telling you <laughs> what your tone's like, but it gives you a good point to start from. Um, we've got live chat integration. So we're just starting looking at that as well on our, our client portal. So our clients can email us in. 
they can log into our portal uh, and just log a ticket, and that's a lot better because we can direct that easier, or they can phone us. And again, through the telephony based or the email based, we get a lot of emails in from clients which basically just say, ah, and that's not a joke. We get one person who sends us basically just exclamation marks and, and screams in an email. There is no way AI is going to make any sense of that, no matter what. But with a normal email, it could potentially assess that what that is, give you a summary, log that ticket for you properly, and then present the last 10 tickets that, of that nature with all the knowledge articles relating to that, things like that. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. We've got a lot of our data teams that are using Copilot for data analysis and building pipelines. Um, and knowledge base is probably a really big thing for us again. We have learned very, well, not the hard way, but we've learned a lot over the last 12 to 18 months about what our data looks like, where it's stored, how we should access it, who needs to access it at what time, what it should look like. Um, and again, we are able to, using our portal, able to share that knowledge base information with our clients so we can build a self-service portal for that. But again, a lot of our data wasn't in a client-friendly manner. We needed to revisit that and we needed to rewrite that. So again, going back to the beginning, it's about having your data in the right place, in the right format and in the right way. Otherwise, it's no use to you in an AI, an automated world. Um, one final point I just want to talk about is, is my kind of dreamlike scenario is I want to be able to work in a service desk, having been a service desk analyst, I want to be able to work where I've got a single pane of view glass of service. So if I use Bob as an example again, lovely Bob, if he raises a ticket with me, I want to be able to see everything that Bob's done. So he's on a laptop. His laptop uh, is a particular version, it's a particular version of Windows, it's compliant, it's non-compliant, um, what software he's got on that um, device. Um, all the information relating to the tickets that he may have logged in the last month or so. Uh, if he's logged it a particular product, so for example, we, we Mimecast, something like that, it'll automatically bring me the information about Mimecast, the top 10 issues that we have faced on a service test within the last month on Mimecast, and it'll automatically bring me the knowledge articles that I might need to use for Bob. And then if I want to connect to Bob's machine, I can press a button through screen, screen connect and I connect to his machine and I can do everything from that. And I can elevate myself to the right level to fix Bob's issues without having to have excessive admin credentials. That to me is the, the dreamlike scenario. I want to have all that information in one view because multiple different views don't work in a service desk environment. And that's a lot of time spent on multiple different systems. ConnectWise, I love the ConnectWise tell us that that's coming and that's coming down the line. And I'm very hopeful that, that is the case because we use multiple different systems every day. There'll be Azure integrations or Intune integrations as well, which is what we want uh, moving forward. And that's really going to help us build our client base. That, I wasn't very slide heavy today because I didn't want to bore you to death. But that is pretty much in a nutshell what I wanted to talk to you all about today. So do you have any queries, questions or otherwise? I can take my glasses off so I can now see you all. There we go. Back there. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> so in regards to AI, where, when you've implemented it, is it segregated just for your use, or are you using a cloud-based AI for the processing? And if so, how does that affect GDPR? So that's a really big conversation point. So did everybody hear that? question so can you summarize it so basically yeah where is your data and the gdpr implications of your data so is it segregated data is it cloud-based data so for ourselves this is a really difficult area to to transition if you've got an it service provider for example and this is a really this is my concern you've got an it service provider providing you with an ai tool so you assume that the AI information that they are taking and taking about my service, about my clients, is hosted within their domain in a safe and, and constructed way. That's your assumption. That's what you're hoping for. You're hoping that you're not putting any information in there that is then publicly available to everybody in the world. You don't want that. So my assumption, <coughs> rightly or wrongly, is that my ITSM tool and my ITSM provider is going to provide me with that information and it's going to secure my data. But how do I prove that? How do I govern that? 
from a client perspective, this is the really, really big piece. And, and again, this is where we're probably going to be leading and assisting our clients more with it. We're not making AI. AI is already there. But what we're doing is assessing how they're going to use that. You can't put your client data in there. You can't, you know, we've got legal firms, for example, who want a really, really quick way to do a really simple legal process, which, as we know, all takes a lot of time to create a legal process. But if you put that out there, can other legal firms use that? If you put any client-specific data that or company-specific data in that, is that out in the wild? Is that it? Is that done? Is it, is it available to everybody? There's going to be huge areas where we're probably going to have to fix. Well, you can't fix, but we're going to have to probably deal with a lot of GDPR breaches and a lot of breach of data while people get a handle on how this is going to work. So yeah, it's a, for me, it's a really, really tough one. And I think that's, again, getting data ready. A lot of people want to jump ahead with this. We're really going to have to put a lot of thought into how you manage your data. Hope that was cool. Anybody else? Right at the front, yeah. Yeah, if you just wait for the mics. Yeah, Paul, you spoke about the, that whole kind of utopia scenario of mm -hmm. having everything in a single pane of glass, and this is probably a very loaded question. Yeah. Um, but how are you going to get there? And how far down the road are you to getting to that, that finish line? If that makes yeah, sense, because I so, think all of us in the room probably would love to get there, yeah. but some of us are probably at very different stages of that journey. Well, the thing is, is that's the, the, the holy grail of what I'm looking for. And again, we don't have our own, we don't create our own system. So we're reliant on our on ConnectWise, our, our partner, in delivering that. And I've been out to America to have a look at the, and I drank from the cup, of, of, of uh, sales pitches out there about that. And they say that that is coming. but. It still, again, it doesn't make it won't make any difference if we are not ready to take that on. So I would love to have that in place, and I would love to have all those processes in place. And we're working to that point of we've been told it's coming, so we're working to that vein. We're getting all our knowledge articles in the right place. We're putting security um, around our screen connections, and we're trying to get everything into that one place with the, the on the basis that that's what we're going to be delivered. Now that might not be the case, but. At the end of the day, it's no bad thing if we've done all of that work anyway, because then we can take any provider on board and we can say, well, all our data is ready, ready to go. We can work on that, but then we know exactly what we want is the other thing. So we've got a bit more of a strong conversation to have with our vendors and we can say, well, this is what we want. They say, ah, yeah, you can bolt that, bolt that, yeah, but can you? I want to see that. I want to see evidence of that. I want you to prove to me that as a service test analyst, I'm not jumping about five different systems to get the information that I need. So we're relying on our, our vendors, and they have a duty of care to deliver that, I think, and that's what we're going to have to task them to. But getting that baseline information is not going to do any harm. Getting yourself ready for that utopia isn't a bad thing, because at the end of the day, you're going to be data ready for anything, and that's kind of the way forward. But you see the, the important part of that being integration rather than... Sorry. Do, do yeah. you see the important part of that being integration rather than a system that does all? Do you see it being multiple different vendors? providing multiple different tools yeah. that will integrate. Seamlessly. It can be, yeah. So we've interviewed people over the last 18 months. And you'd be surprised how many guys that we interview, or guys or gals that we interview, that have, they don't use an ITSM tool in any format. They're still using emails to log things. So there's still a lot of people out there that haven't even got to the point of having an ITSM tool in place. And there's probably a lot of people out there who think, well, why do I need one? What's, what benefits is it giving me? I've been using emails for five, 10 years. It's going to be great. What's, what's, the, what's the benefit to that? So you need to have that kind of conversation with them to get them on, on that. But there is a lot of different ways, and it really is just how it works for you. We put a lot of effort into Kinetalize, but we can put PIA on that. We can use Halo ITSM because it integrates with Automate, which is a different part of Kinetalize. So we are not bound to Kinetalize, and that's the one thing that we made very clear to them is that we still want to get our house in order and do everything right. But if you're not going to deliver what you've said you're going to deliver, then we will go to somebody else who can. And you're right, you can select different parts of that at all. The PA integration is really good because you just buy the chatbot and the integration of that, and it goes and does that all by itself. You don't need to buy the full suite to do all of that. You've got that integration to do that. So it's a, it's a grading on, of where you are as a business and as a service desk and what you, what you use. And the person that you spoke about who basically sends you a message, which is 25 exclamation marks and arg at yeah. the end of it, have they just found a really clever way of speaking to a human being faster? No, they, 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 they oh. retirement is a good way forward for them. I think that's, that's probably what we're hoping for. 
it's <laughs> retirement. But it's that's that's the we I had a conversation before. And it's, it's basically you've got a lot of people who fear change. We fear change. And AI is a really, really big change. It's a really big step forward. People are only just getting around to the idea of using new technologies and using the cloud. And now we're going to start throwing out the fact that it can do it all for you and talk back to you and have a conversation with you. And people are like, oh, no, thank you. No, no, I want my, 90, I want my old Mac that I love to bits. I never, you know, bulletproof, fireproof, all that kind of stuff. So taking people on that journey. So it is a lot to ask. You, for our clients, we just transitioned some of them into the cloud, we did move them into, into Azure, into Intune managed devices, and then you're going to have this other conversation with them about what Copilot could do for them as a business. It might be a little bit, bit too much too soon, so we're probably going to need to see that. But it, it's banging the drum. There's meetings all around the place about legal firms and what Copilot can do for them. So we have to jump on the bandwagon for that, and we have to join them with that, but we've got to act more as advisors and protectors of that rather than telling them to go ahead and do it, we've got to say, well, hang on a minute, and you're not ready for this. Yeah. And they could, hopefully they listen. Paul, thank you very much. No thank, Paul. thank you very much.